Welcome to our Bible study for this week. We are continuing, of course, in the Encounter uh, Bible study material coming from the Cumberland Presbyterian Church. We are continuing this summer with our study of the Psalms, and today we are looking at the 32nd Psalm. But before we get to the 32nd Psalm, let me ask you, what do you know about the childhood of George Washington? And my guess is that if you are thinking about that for a moment or two, what you know about his childhood more than anything else is that he chopped down the cherry tree. I was uh, teaching the children in Day Players Chapel this week about the, the early life of Jesus and the few stories that we have about Jesus as a child. And I asked them about George Washington. What do we know? And they remembered the story of the cherry tree. And several of them said, but that story isn't true. That story isn't true. And they're right. It never happened. Uh, we are very confident that it never happened. But it still is a wonderful, wonderful parable for us. And particularly if you know the story in its entirety. And I actually didn't until uh, this week. I happened to hear somebody tell the whole story. So here's the whole story. The story, which again is more parable than truth, but but a lot of truth, at least more parable than reality, but containing a lot, a lot of truth in it, is that young George Washington had a hatchet that he just loved. And like uh, many uh, young men and young women that have a hatchet or a pocket knife, he wanted to see what it could do. And he chopped uh, several things uh, down, chopped, uh, you use it in, in, in several very innocent ways, and then decided to go after his dad's prized cherry tree. And apparently this is a very rare cherry tree, a very va valuable cherry tree, and the tree is absolutely ruined and it dies. His father asked, who chopped my cherry tree. And young George Washington offers that immortal line, I cannot lie, I chopped the cherry tree. And we know that part of the story, but the end of the story that I didn't know is that his father immediately takes him into his arms with a huge grin on his face and holds him tight and says, Oh son, your honesty is worth more to me than a thousand cherry trees. And I love that because that, that parable does suggest to us that, that when we offer confession, that, that, that the, our confessions often almost obliterate the sin that came behind it. When we are offer confessions, the way to reconciliation comes very, very fast and grace can come very, very fast. A couple of years ago at First Cumberland, we had a guest and uh, there was a, a friend of hers happened to be in the congregation. And so after the service, uh, she went and, and spoke with her and was encouraging her. I hope that you will come back and visit with us again. And the, the woman said, I can't. I'll never be able to come here again. And, and her friend said, well, why? And she said, because I just can't worship in a church that forces me to confess. And, and uh, her friend, our church member, told me uh, that story later. And uh, it really changed the way that I do confession, because I recognize that although it certainly was not my intention for that woman to feel as if she was being judged, or, or it was not my intention to try to make that woman feel bad about herself, I worried that perhaps that was what we were doing unintentionally. And I'm fully aware that, that a lot of what was going on with her very much predated when the, her ever setting foot in our sanctuary. And yet I don't want to blame her for the way she felt. I want to see what can we learn about that. And so I realized that our confessions need to be a time when we're honest with God about what we have done. I cannot lie to you, God. I chopped down the cherry tree. I cannot lie to you, God. I have been selfish. I have been hurtful. I have been resentful. Whatever sins that I have committed, I cannot lie to you, O oh God, about those things. And yet God's response is not to say, well, you ought to feel awful about yourself but it is to wrap us up in forgiveness. Uh, hopefully, uh, George Washington's father said to him, you know, what can you learn from this? And hopefully, George Washington learned that when you have a hatchet, you have a responsibility uh, to use it in a proper way. And if you use it in an improper way, you may find yourself in trouble. Make sure that you do it, do it well. God wraps us up in love and grace and forgiveness and then offers to show us a better way. What can we learn from this and how can we move forward so that next week you won't be confessing the same sin that you confessed this past week? And that leads us right up to the 32nd Psalm. Uh, the lesson title is The Joy of Forgiveness, and indeed that is what uh, this psalm uh, uh, shows to us. I'll be reading the first 11 verses of Psalm 32. Happy are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. 
while I kept silence, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all who are faithful offer prayer to you. At a time of distress, the rush of almighty waters shall not reach them. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with glad cries of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be like a horse or a mule without understanding, whose temper must be curbed with bit and bridle, else it will not stay near you. Many are the torments of the wicked, but the steadfast love surrounds those who trust in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Those wonderful words remind us and tell us who is it that is happy? What is the condition of those who confess? It is happiness. It is joy. And what is the condition of those who refuse to acknowledge their sin, who refuse to confess their sin, who, who refuse to ask God to help them deal with their sin, with their mistakes, with the ways that they have fallen short? They are feeling like the heavy hand is upon them. They are feeling crushed. They feel like, and this imagery I think is so beautiful uh, or and terrifying, they feel like a, a hot, dry desert in the middle of a drought in the heat of summer. Uh, we all, I suspect, have known that, have felt that when we have known that we needed to confess either to God or to others and just have been afraid to and, and have tried to maybe justify what we were doing or whatever and nothing works and we just feel as if nothing goes right for us and we can't sleep well sometimes and uh, we, uh, we do feel like maybe there's a heavy hand on us. I sometimes feel that right in the center of my chest or we feel like we're just all dried up like the drought of the desert. The lesson here is that failing to confess can make us feel even worse than uh, rising and getting the courage to actually offer a confession. And again, whether that is to God or another person. And oftentimes our confession may begin with God and we may recognize that God is now calling us to go to another person that we have wronged and confess to them as well. And, and we talked about that a little bit uh, last week in our 51st Psalm uh, exploration. And I want to remind you again from last week how I talked to you a little bit at Randy Pausch and how he shared with us that the three uh, components of a really good apology. And it works whether it is a confession when we're confessing to God or whether we're confessing to someone else. And the first thing that a good apology has is the idea that we say to the other, what I did was wrong, period. Not what I did was wrong, but let me explain. Not what I did was wrong, but let me rationalize. What I did was wrong, but you made me do it. What I did was wrong, but I can't help it. What I did was wrong, but I was raised that way. No, there can be no excuses. What I did was wrong, period. And then secondly, we have to say, I feel badly that what I did harmed you. And there's a couple of components in there. The first is, it's not that I'm sorry that you are hurt by what I did, because I'm not saying that I really recognize that what I did was wrong. I'm sorry you got hurt by what I did, but I probably have a rationalization for it. The other thing about that is, if I say I feel badly that you were hurt by what I did, I'm not saying I feel bad that I got caught. I feel badly because I am hurting because of what I did, but I feel badly because what I did harmed you. Now, quite likely, when I harm you, it also harms me. And so the bad, uh, the bad part that I feel is that our relationship is not where it needs to be. And it's okay to say, yeah, I'm suffering the consequences of my sin as well, but it's not all about I need to be absolved so that I feel better, but I feel badly because I have harmed you. And when you say to God, I feel badly because my actions have either harmed you, because God can be harmed by us, because God chooses in his infinite power. He doesn't have to. God doesn't need us, and yet God chooses to love us, and so we can harm God uh, when we do not love God back in the proper way. And we also harm God by thwarting God's will in the world. When I do things in the world, when I I'm not generous and I hoard my goods. I'm harming other people and that harms God's will in the world. That can harm our witness, my witness of God. I'm not showing the glory of God. And so I feel badly that what I did 
harmed you. And then third, finally, and in some ways the one that we most usually want to leave off is, what can I do to make the situation better? George Washington's father, I would hope, didn't simply hug him and say how wonderful it is that you're honest, but helped him figure out, now what are you going to do next time? Uh, well, how are you going to make sure that you use your hatchet responsibly? And that's what we have to do. We have to say, and it's hard to say. It's hard to say to God, and it's hard to say to someone else because we're putting our fate in their hands. What can I do to change the situation? Really, what this is all about is that theological term, repentance. Uh, Jesus' very first sermon, the very first words out of his mouth in his public uh, uh, declaration are repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And sometimes that word repentance uh, repels us a little bit. We think about the guy holding the sign on the on the road or whatever, you know, repent. And, and, and it's almost the, the Jonathan Edwards, the, the, the old uh, evangelist, uh, sinners in the hands of an angry God and repent or God's just going to crush you and that kind of thing. But in fact, listen to what Jesus says. Repent because the kingdom of heaven is near. He's saying literally turn around. That's what the word repent means. The word uh, repent in uh, the Greek is metanoia, and it means turn around. Turn around and look and follow after the kingdom of heaven. I love the way that I think Eugene Peterson is trying to help us see this in the way that he translates uh, this psalm. Uh, he translates verses 8 through 10 in this way in the message. Let me give you some good advice. I'm looking you in the eye and I'm giving it to you straight. Don't be ornery like a horse or a mule that needs bit and bridle to stay on track. God defiers are always in trouble. God affirmers find themselves loved every time they turn around. I can be a God defier by refusing to acknowledge my sin and confess my sin. I'm going to find myself in trouble constantly. But when I am a God affirmer, I find myself loved by God every time I turn around. That's turning away from my sin? Yes, absolutely. And it's also turning away from my sin and then simultaneously turning toward God. The story of George Washington is really a parable. It's not a literal true story that actually happened. But another story that is literally true is the story of Millard Fuller and how he founded Habitat for Humanity. But it becomes a parable for us as well and a wonderful uh, paraphrase almost, if you will, of the 32nd Psalm. And so I want you to see now and hear in Millard and Linda, his wife's uh, own words, I want you to hear uh, his story and hear how uh, he was able to confess and then to repent, to turn toward God, and the difference it made in his life and the difference it's made in the life of our world. Hear and see now this story. And the next day we decided, heck, we need to go in business because we both had no money and our idea was to make all the money we could possibly make. I was uh, just finishing undergraduate and he was starting his first year in law school. Uh, I was married and he soon got a girlfriend, Linda. I knew that when I married Millard, he had the Midas touch. He had the skills and the talents to make things work. And it made us a fortune. And we got everything that money will get for you. A big house, big cars, 2,000 acres of land, horses, cattle, speedboats. We had been living a very wealthy lifestyle. Um, Millard was in business and working night and day and weekends too without much time for me or the kids. This wonderful young woman that I had married when I was a senior in law school, uh, Linda Caldwell, um, I ensconced her in a beautiful house with a brand new Lincoln Continental to drive and a maid and too many clothes to get in the closet, but she had no husband. Mm -hmm. uh, I was never home. Uh, I'd, sometimes I'd sleep at the office. It was just an unbridled quest for wealth. And uh, she and I drew apart, and uh, she ended up leaving me, and we, were, we came so close to, to our marriage disintegrating. And we had a breakthrough in our relationship and decided we did not want to break up our family. And I turned to Linda and I said, I think we should give everything we got away and make ourselves poor again and just throw ourselves on God's mercy and ask him to guide us. She didn't hesitate a minute. I didn't say this to him, but I sat there and listened to what he told me he was going to do, and I thought to myself, you're crazy as hell. 
I was surprised that he wanted to uh, sell me his interest in the company. And he said, he, well, he didn't want any of the money, he wanted to give it to projects that he believed in. And so for the next 10 years, uh, instead of paying him, I made the payments to the various projects that he wanted me to, to give the money to. And somebody once said, when the student is ready to learn, the teacher appears. And we were ready to learn, and the teacher appeared in the person of Clarence Jordan. This was a man I had never heard of in my life. He started with his wife Florence, a small Christian community near America's Georgia called Cornelia Farm. He gave me insights into the incredible importance of incarnating God's Word in now. It wasn't called Habitat for Humanity in those days. Mm -hmm. We called it partnership housing, but the concepts were worked out. We had the first house under construction, and uh, he died suddenly, but I felt, by that point, I said, this is my life's calling. This is why I'm on this earth. And I'll never forget seeing him seated, seated there at his desk. And it was obvious to me as soon as I saw him that he was dead. But then I literally remember uh, saying out loud, Clarence, you made it. You made it. You've been faithful uh, to your beliefs. You've been faithful to Christ. And uh, God has now called you home. Millard's sin was the sin of idolatry. And his idol was money. He decided that money was the thing that could make him happy. Money was the thing that's going to make both him and his wife and his family happy. And so he began pursuing money. Jesus calls money mammon and literally a false god. And false gods promise us life. They promise us happiness and they can't deliver. And we need more and more and more and we never have enough and they never are able to deliver uh, for us. And we see that's exactly what happened. Miller didn't have any time to enjoy his two speedboats and his house at the lake or his 2,000 acres and his horses. He didn't even have time to enjoy his family or his wife because he was working, 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 even sleeping at the office because that idol that he was worshiping kept demanding more. You have to gain more of me. You have to gain more of me and you'll never be happy until you gain more. And finally, when Linda had had enough and she realized that, that his life was just like that barren desert, that the psalm talks about. There was nothing there. There was nothing growing. There was no joy there. Just a barren desert in the middle of the summer heat. And she decides, I want out. Uh, that was his wake-up call. And boy, did he get a wake-up call. And so he confesses, I realize, I've been seeking money. And even though he could have said, I've been seeking money, but it was for you, but it was for the kids, but it was for our happiness, he recognizes what I did was wrong. And what I did hurt you. And so now I've got to figure out what can I do to remedy the situation? What can I do to make the situation better? And amazingly, how does he turn away from that idol? He turns completely away. And he says to her, let's give it all away. Let's go back to being poor and trust in God's mercy. Wow. Little wonder that uh, Doyle Fuller, whom I'm assuming is a relative, maybe a brother, thought, I thought he was crazy. Uh, any of us almost would. And yet, think for a moment. Would you rather be the Millard Fuller with 2,000 acres and the, the uh, lake house and the, and the speed boats and all and absolutely miserable? Or would you like to be the Millard Fuller with almost nothing and yet helping people have housing and having a, a wife and children who love him and having the time to be with them and having this wonderful mentor who was able to teach him so very much and they were able to share so much together about the life of Jesus and trying to live a life of Jesus and recognizing that in giving his life to God, God was going to give him life and life eternal. That's why he could say to Clarence Jordan uh, as he saw there his dead body in his little office, he could say to him, you made it. God is giving to you absolutely everything now. It's a wonderful story, a wonderful parable, a wonderful paraphrase of this psalm. But let us not just hear the story and say, well, isn't that inspiring? But let us take the opportunity today to confess. What resentments do you have? What idols are saying to you, if only you pursue me, then you will be happy. If only you had 
a better relationship or a different relationship, if only you had more money, if only you had a different title, if only you had a different friend, if only you had X, Y, or Z, whatever it might be, what idols are you worshiping? And can you turn to God during a time of summer drought and heat and say, God, I need your living water, water of forgiveness, but water also that will bring new life to me so that I can turn to you. Someone once said, I've never forgotten it and I love it, that Jesus promised his followers three things. That they would, that he would always be with them. That they would get into trouble and that they would be absurdly happy. When we confess our sin to God and when we turn away from our sin and turn toward God, we discover that God is always with us. And we may find ourselves in trouble, but we will also find ourselves absurdly happy. And so my encouragement to you and my prayer for me is that we will do that this day and in the days to come. Amen.